Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to Bread and Roses. I'm Aram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Boris Puya. In this week's program, we interview Robin Blumner from Richard Dawkins Foundation and Centre for Inquiry. We'll also be talking about the hunger strike of several political prisoners in Iran, namely Aras Sajari and their very, very difficult situation that they're in, life-threatening situation. We'll talk about a statement signed by over 300 women who face violence against religious arbitration and Sharia courts in Britain, as well as a campaign asking people to comment on why One Law for All. We'll uh, have an insane fatwa on Metallica, Metallica and, and metal bands. Yeah, and that's a really interesting fatwa. You don't want to miss it. And our slice of life is from Paradis Garuri, who is a singer, rapper, a woman's rights activist in Afghanistan, and a song she sung for her cousins and women there. Stay with us. <laughs> This week we have received news of the political prisoner Aras Sadeghi's deteriorating health. He's been on hunger strike for almost 50 days now. He's lost an immense amount of weight and uh, there is uh, news that he can't speak anymore and people are very concerned that he's not going to pull through. And the reason he's having a hunger strike is because of uh, a protest against the situation of prisons as well as the fact that his wife has been arrested and sentenced to six years in prison. Yeah, and the story of these two, it's very interesting because it's a story of many, many young people in Iraq. Hundreds and thousands of young people suffer exactly the same, uh, from the same condition um, of work living under the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, Arash Shadaghi is a student of philosophy, he was a student of philosophy at uh, Tehran University. Um, he was arrested for his basic human right activity. He didn't, he, you know, his friends said that he didn't belong to any political party, but he was accused of um, you know, campaigning against the state security, against the foundations of the Islamic Republic of Iran, insulting the founder of the Islamic Republic, you name it. Every charge has been thrown at him. And also when they raided his home to arrest him, the first time they did it, his mother had a heart attack. She died a few days later. This next time that they raided his home, they found uh, uh, some notes that his wife had written, an unpublished story against stoning. And because of that, she's been mm -hmm. sentenced to six years in prison. So this is just one case that really highlights the injustice of the Islamic regime system. I mean, you hear the case of his lawyer not being allowed to attend the trial. The second time, he is not allowed to look at some of the case files. I mean, it's just one, you know, miscarriage of justice after another. Yeah, and, and in, interesting, you know, he, in these days, quite a number of political prisoners in Iran have taken the step of drastic step of um, um, going on hunger strike. This is something that generally sort of political prisoners do not do in Iran because it's that tradition of, uh, you know, you have to, you know, that's the last step that you have to take. But the situation that nobody could hear the voice, people don't listen to uh, the condition. And that's the only way they, the, the, is left to them, or they believe is left to them, to take that drastic action of going on hunger strike. Um, and he's not the only one who's done. There's about four or five other political prisoners currently are on mm -hmm. hu hunger strike. The Azari activists, there are people who are even supporters of uh, President Rouhani. He is, is in prison, and he had to. Uh, resort to um, a hunger strike, and that, that's the situation a lot of people are Yeah, Morteza Muradpur is the Azari activist who's also uh, been on hunger strike for almost 50 days. Then there's Ali Sh uh, Shariati who's um, also on hunger strike. So, you know, obviously hunger strikes are so detrimental to the health and well-being of prisoners, and one of the things that's important is for people to be able to remain alive to keep fighting but it is one way in which people are trying to get the mm. word out. There are other forms of protest as well. I mean, we heard news of the women's ward in Evin protesting to such an extent that the regime was forced to allow 
Arash to meet his wife Golroch just for a very brief time. They weren't permitting it otherwise. Yeah, yeah. and I think it's important to highlight these cases, and we actually want all of our viewers to support um, the uh, case of these two as representing a lot of other political prisoners under the Islamic Republic of Iran. Yeah, definitely. I think what they does it does show is the injustice of religious rules, whatever religion it may be. And in this case, we're talking about Sharia rules. And of course, if we look at Britain, there is this big campaign, One Law for All, against Sharia courts in Britain. And uh, interestingly enough, recently, over 300 women signed a statement, uh, women who faced violence, honor-based violence, domestic violence, and so on and so forth, signed a statement saying that they don't want religious arbitration in their lives because it doesn't give them the justice that they yeah, deserve. And the question is that, would the British government, would the uh, uh, parliament and the members of parliament listen to the voice of these women who've suffered under the Sharia law? Mm. Or are they going to pack the inquiry in the investigation with Islamists and supporters of Sharia courts? I mean, that's a crucial point. And it seems to me, sometimes I feel, I get this feeling that the establishment in Britain across the spec political spectrum they actually intend to hold on and grab onto sharia law mm. and no matter how much you provide evidence no matter how much you expose the status of sharia councils and sharia courts in britain it seems that you know you're talking to the wall you know as, nobody could as, hear you uh, the algerian sociologist maria mahela lucas says is that you know the uh, the uh, colonial uh, colonialists the former colonialists don't want to have uh, the same rights and uh, laws as those the natives. Yes. The natives always have to have different types of rights and it, it, it continues here in Britain as well. But there's a campaign, hashtag One Law for All Because, and we're asking secularists and women's rights campaigners to explain why they think there should be One Law for All. Uh, so do, do join that hashtag if you're able to. Recently, when I was at the European Parliament, I was able to interview Robin Blomner about the amazing work of the Richard Dawkins Foundation and the Center for Inquiry. Now, you know, she raises some really important points in this interview. And one is, of course, the importance of being openly secular, even in a place like the United States. You know, we keep thinking that this is an issue that's only relevant to people in the Middle East and North Africa, countries under Islamic rule. But of course, we see that it is an issue anywhere that the religious right have some sort of power and influence. Absolutely. And I think this is important across the world. It doesn't matter which country you are. Join this campaign. This is an important campaign. Everybody needs to come and speak about being uh, atheist, non-believer, agnostic, and we need to make sure and secular and secular and we need to make sure this uh, this campaign it's international is worldwide there's a lot of resource for this because we know we we've, we've, we've tried to publicize the fact that in Africa in North Africa in uh, Middle East you know the the movement for secularism the movement for uh, atheism is that we've talked about tsunami of atheism and people but at the same time people need to be able to come out and express this publicly. So this is an important campaign across the United States, Europe, Middle East and Middle East and North Africa. Globally, globally. Yes. Stay with us and watch this really interesting interview. It's a great pleasure to have you with us on the program. I wanted to speak to you about what you were saying at the European Parliament just recently on the situation of atheists in America. Tell us a little about that. There's a, there are standing rates of anti-atheist bias in the United States, and I don't think necessarily European or world citizens know about it. You know, they interact with some of the top Americans who, of course, are more than tolerant of non-believers, but in fact, large swaths of the United States are fiercely intolerant of atheists and agnostics. In fact, fully 49% of Americans say they would not want a close family member to marry an atheist. You only have 9% of Americans who say they wouldn't want a family member to marry a born-again Christian. Um, if you're looking in the political world, 
Forty percent of Americans say that they wouldn't vote for an otherwise qualified candidate for president if he or she were an atheist. Then that polls the worst of any category except socialist. Um, so you can see that there's just this built-in disdain towards atheists and non-believers. And I think that derives in part from the fact that America is really quite a religious nation and not enough people know that they know atheists and non-believers. It's very easy for atheists to remain silent and quiet and, and not come out. And so one of the things that my work includes um, is an attempt to get non-believers to be a lot more vocal about who they are. We know that it worked for the LGBT community. You know, when, when they told their friends, neighbors, coworkers, and loved ones who they are, really, uh, it really changed attitudes, you know? People went from feeling as though uh, non feeling as though gay people were alien or the other to knowing someone and caring about someone. I think it really changed the way people viewed gays and lesbians and it can help for atheists as well. And I suppose linked with this uh, issue of atheism is also how science is viewed with the question of evolution. It, it's quite worrying, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. I, well, just think about it. Um, the, the fact is that 42% of Americans say that human beings arrived on this earth fully formed within the last 10,000 years. Four in 10 Americans reject the idea that human beings evolved. It's maybe just kind of almost comical to some people, you know, certainly to people who understand the science, but there are real life consequences to that kind of science denial. I mean, it, it informs a lot of public policy when your ideas are grounded in religious dogma rather than in scientific truth, then you get it wrong on things like climate change, stem cell research, and even abortion policy. And when non-believers can't get elected to public office because something of the order of 40% of people won't vote for an open atheist, it means the only people that get elected in the United States are either religious people or hypocrites. So either people who truly you know, believe in the supernatural, or there are people who don't believe but don't say it out loud or pretend otherwise. So open atheists are precluded from the public policy table and from lawmaking. And, and that means some of the smartest critical thinkers, evidence-based thinkers, are not participating in creating the laws for, the, for a nation that really depends on science and technology for its future. And with tr Trump coming to power now, I mean, it just seems to personify that sort of attitude, doesn't it? So the, uh, okay, so the organizations, the Center for Inquiry and the Richard Dawkins Foundation are nonpartisan, and we did not take sides in the election, but we can certainly speak to the, the policies that are emanating out of a potential Trump administration, and they're very scary. You have a situation where uh, Donald Trump it has been a climate change denier, and he's chosen as his vice president Mike Pence, who is a, an avowed creationist. Uh, he took to the House floor when he was a representative from Indiana to denounce the idea of human evolution uh, and embrace intelligent design and say that, the, that that theory of t intelligent design, which of course is not a true scientific theory should be taught in schools alongside evolution. Those are, that's a dangerous way to uh, promote education where you're injecting religion into a science curriculum. And then you have uh, Donald Trump who's already made it clear that he supports a $20 billion private school voucher program where he would be diverting tax money to underwrite private school education and most of that will be religiously affiliated and parochial school education. So it means taxpayers of the United States will be helping to fund indoctrinating education in, in various religions for, for young people. You know, public schools are the great pluralist education. You know, it, it's opportunity for people from everywhere to come together, grow up together, learn uh, the same body of knowledge. But when you have private school vouchers, it means 
division. It means people will be going to their mutual corners and learning facts and history skewed by the institution that they're going to. And if it's a religious institution, they're going to be learning a lot of mythology that turns out just to have no factual basis. And it can have, once again, real-life consequences for America going forward. Yeah, definitely. I mean, my sister is a public school teacher at Yonkers, and they're very worried about the situation. Um, I guess one of the questions is, there seems to be such a contradiction, because the U.S. is a secular state, and then there's so much more religion than Britain, which is, for example, not secular, but the society is so much more secularized. It's a very interesting conundrum why the United States is so overtly religious when we were the country that created the principle of church-state separation, and probably one of the greatest advances of the Enlightenment. There have been a lot of hypotheses put forward. One of the ones that I think is most compelling is that because America doesn't have a, a government state, I mean, one of the, the uh, hypotheses put forward that I think is most compelling is because America doesn't have a state religion, all religions are competing for money, for power, for influence, for people. And so there's an entrepreneurial spirit within American religion that doesn't exist necessarily in European countries because in Europe religion already receives a portion of tax money, it's supported by the state, they don't really have to do much to be comfortable. And so it's, it's a tamer form of religion. It's certainly not a proselytizing form of religion in Europe. Whereas in America, in order for, for these religions to survive, they constantly have to grow. So they're out there marketing, they're out there putting, pushing themselves, they're doing missionary work, they're knocking on doors. And that's the way you, you expand and you gain adherence. What's the openly secular campaign? Why that? The, uh, the Center for Inquiry and the Richard Dawkins Foundation have launched the Openly Secular Campaign, and it's taking a page from the LGBT handbook. We know that when somebody is, is made aware that a friend of theirs, a coworker, or loved ones is an atheist, attitudes change. People go from being scared, fearful, uh, or antagonistic towards non-believers to rethinking this prejudice and, and changing their view about it. You know, uh, lots of people th somehow think that non-believers don't have a moral code, which is patently absurd. Of course, most people don't really get their moral code from their religion. Um, if you read the Bible, you would definitely not want to adopt a code that include, included repression of women and slavery and other horrific uh, elements. We, we are empathetic people in general. Um, human beings come with a form of compassion built into us and you can be a humanist without believing in the supernatural or believing in a deity. But for some reason, there's this connection between atheism and immorality, and that is an unfair presumption that has to be broken. One of the ways to do that is with our openly secular campaign, is to show that good, average, normal, everyday people are non-believers. You know them, you like them, you may even love them. You just don't know who they are yet, and we're asking non-believers to come forward. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Robert. Okay, Marianne. Great. The Insane Fatwa this week is about Metallica, metal music, and it's so insane you would never guess what the insanity is all about. But I mean, what are some of the things you would that comes to mind when you think about metal music? I, I mean, one of the things that I think about it's I mean, very loud music. Yeah. Or you're showing your yes, age. Yes, I know. Yeah? I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> or it would be the case that you know they, they are you know the the speed and the rhythm of the uh, metal music is very industrial. 
That's the other thing. <laughs> I mean, you could actually discuss and think about what you hear. What does that mean in when you listen to metal and Metallica? I would stop you right there because I think we should leave it to the experts to yes. tell us what Metallica really means. Because, you know... Just listen to this and we'll listen. come back in a minute. Drumbo, heavy metal, what is it? Metallica, what do you know? آنتی یکی از اصولش اینه آنتی جنس مخالفه یعنی دختره متال آنتی بویزن پسره متال آنتی گرزن خب آنتی جنس مخالف یعنی ضد جنس مخالف یکی از مرام ناماش اینه مثلا یه دختر متال هر جا تونست یه پسر بکشه و این کار انجام بده کلیش رو زیر آب کنه جز افتخار So you have it there I mean if you do see any metal girls or boys but mostly girls, he's very focused and obsessed with them, you better run a mile a minute because, you know, there's going to be some sort of drowning or decapitation taking place. <laughs> you don't want to listen to this guy. You don't want to listen to this But guy. he's, you know, he's, uh, he, he's quite serious and he's obviously got some English words in there as well, anti-boys and anti-girls. <laughs> Boys and girls killing each other, drowning each other, anyhow. Yeah, so, service. yeah, well, don't say we didn't warn you if you listen to metal music or you suddenly meet someone who likes Metallica. <laughs> wonderful slice of life this week is of this Afghan singer, rap singer, Paradi Sururi, who's done some brilliant work, brilliant songs on women's rights in that country. A rebellion, that's what it is. I mean, she can't encapsulate this rebellion of Afghan women. Just listen to this. This brings us, we want to end our program with this piece from uh, her performance. Um, and that brings us to the end of our program. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed this week's program. We're going to be away for two weeks during the holidays and uh, New Year. We wish you a wonderful, wonderful New Year. And we'll see you in two weeks. Until then, have a wonderful holiday and time. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm not a sassy, 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 I